you today. So glad to see you here. Can everyone hear me? We're, are we loud enough? Are we loud enough in the back, Houston? Yeah, they're good back there. Is that all right? Okay, great. Uh, so glad you're all here today. Uh, we have some guests with us. We're very, very glad you joined us. My name is Debbie Callahan. I'm Vice President of Marketing, Marketing and Development here at Westminster Canterbury. And I'm very pleased to do the uh, welcome and intro for our guest speaker. Uh, just a little bit of a format for you. Um, we will have some time briefly to take questions at the end. And we're going to handle it like we do CONFAB. So Connie and I will have the wireless microphones that we will bring around. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and we'll get the mics to you so you can ask a question. This is being recorded and it will be shown on our in-house TV channel at another time. And we will publicize when that's going to be if you want to watch it again or if you know someone who has missed it or something like that. Uh, so that's how our format's going to go. Uh, so that's, that's kind of what we're going to do. Uh, I guess that's all I needed to review. All right. We're very pleased to have Dr. Len Lechi with us. He's a professor of psychology at the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and is director of clinical services for the Mars Memory Health Network, which is a memory clinic that focuses on early detection. He has a PhD from Arizona State University and he attended Harvard Medical School. He specializes in the assessment of memory and clinical disorders and over the last 13 years has been involved in a project to maximize the early detection of memory problems. Uh -huh. Dr. Lechi has published extensively in the top journals in psychology and medicine, written a textbook, received grant funding from the National Science Foundation and Alzheimer's of North Carolina. He has briefed Congress, and he survived, <laughs> <laughs> and has been awarded numerous teaching awards from the University of North Carolina at Wilmington and from the UNC Board of Governors. He has served on the board of directors for the Eastern North Carolina chapter of the Alzheimer's Association and for the nonprofit Alzheimer's North Carolina, Inc. Dr. Lechi has also served on the 2015 North Carolina Institute of Medicine Task Force on Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So please give a warm welcome to Dr. Len Lechi. challenge in the sense that uh, we think of moving any target, changing anything. Obviously, the earlier you begin to change, the easier it is. So if we started doing a health regimen with you uh, when you were 20 and we instituted, well, by the time you got to 75, 80, the effects of that would have paid off quite a bit. Um, but what we're talking about here is really a challenge to say, what if we didn't do anything and we just started at age 70? Can we still have an effect? starting to save money at age seven for your retirement, right? It seems a little late. Well, as it turns out, there's actually some pretty good news out there um, as far as what you can accomplish, even if we start later in the game. So one of the things I'd like to do today is really start to uh, introduce what I might call a culture shift. Um, and it's a culture shift in the sense that, as you know, particularly as we age, um, we spend a fair amount of time, resources, financial, temporal resources, cognitive energy on preserving our health, really preserving our health. But the truth is, we don't do this equally for our brain and the rest of our body. In fact, we traditionally put a lot of emphasis on our body and very little emphasis on preserving our brain. And it's, this is a bit of a, a problem uh, that we kind of let happen, this gap that occurs. So we, we know, oh, it's important, we want to live a long life. We spend all our time basically from the neck down, and we don't do anything from the neck up. Um, and of course, the consequence of that might be, well, okay, now we're physically healthy, we'll live a long time, 
but we haven't taken care of the brain, and thus it's not around to enjoy the body's health. Um, and so one of the things that I'd like to encourage here today is thinking about our brain proactively. In other words, if you think about when we start worrying about the brain, it's usually when it's breaking down. Prior to that, we just think, well, it's humming along, no problem. Uh, and so I'm going to introduce this idea of sort of the uh, service maintenance, if you will, from the neck up. Uh, we sometimes call it a checkup from the neck up. Uh, I came up that, by the way, so if you like that, um, at the memory center. So let me begin just by show, sharing with you some really critical findings, uh, one in particular that sort of has helped us launch in this direction. Um, and this is a classic study back in 2006, uh, the Rush University study. Um, and it was a post-mortem analysis of brains. And um, these were not individuals that were specifically targeted for having any problems. These were people who had just donated their brains to science. Um, and so they reviewed this rather large uh, data set. And what, one of the things that they found that was pretty incredible was that fully a third of these individuals um, had essentially what we would call a dementia brain. Meaning they had the plaques, they had the tangles, um, everything, signs of strokes, which of course would be different types of dementia, vascular dementia. Um, but these individuals were showing no outward signs or consequences of that dementia looking brain. And this led scientists to a, an interesting sort of path of analysis, and that is to understand that while we tie a lot of these things like plaques and signs of strokes and tangles, etc to the etiology for dementia, it also doesn't mean that if you have those things, you necessarily will have the upward signs of dementia. And remember, for everyone sitting in this room, I'm going to suggest to you that you don't really care if there are plaques and tangles in your brain. What you care is if your brain functionally works for you. Because if you didn't have the plaques but it wasn't functioning, that'd be a problem. If you did have the plaques and it was functioning, you wouldn't even know. So in the end, it's the functional abilities that matter. This has led uh, the scientific community um, to redefine what it means to have dementia. And I'll often refer to dementia, the Alzheimer's type in particular, just because it's a progressive, slowly progressing dementia. But this applies to vascular dementia and other dementias as well. And I'll briefly touch on those as well. Um, and that is to say that there's a series of events that occur throughout our lifetime. Some of the very first ones we have no control over. Uh, genetic markers, genetic predispositions for particular uh, diseases. So if you think of Alzheimer's, a big marker would be like the ApoE4 uh, allele, and that's a very strong marker for predicting the onset of the dementia, the Alzheimer's type. Um, but many of those individuals who have that marker will not ultimately develop <coughs> Alzheimer's. It's not a guarantee. It just means you have a higher risk. So, a subset of those individuals will go on to have those plaques and tangles and signs of strokes. But not all of those will show the outward signs. So in other words, we have this progression, if you will, almost like a lifelong progression of at the genetic level, at the um, uh, structural, ch actual structural changes that are occurring, biochemical changes, and then the outward manifestation. And we lose people at each stage. So not everyone who has the former will move on, even though the majority will move on. And so this leads us to the question of, is there something that keeps that functional consequence from happening? In other words, I might not be able to stop the accumulation of plaques, maybe, although we're working on it. But what if we can stop the functional consequences? So very briefly, just want to make sure we're on the same page. When we're talking about threats to the brain, as I said, I referred to Alzheimer's dementia. Um, and that uh, is the most common form of dementia. Uh, obviously, it's uh, particularly for older individuals. So when we're talking about, for example, 70 and up, it is the, the most common by far type of dementia. Um, and it's progressive and tends to be sort of a gradual, for most people, relatively slow decline. Uh, there's a few exceptions to that. Uh, vascular dementias are the next most common. So these uh, uh, onset, with, as I said, like stroke, multi-impart dementia is another name for it. But there are a number of other dementias that are less frequent, but uh, typically just affect different parts of the brain. So frontal temporal dementia, as the name implies, affects the frontal temporal uh, lobes. Alzheimer's, by the way, is typically um, uh, in the temporal lobes. Um, vascular dementia can really occur just about anywhere uh, in its presentation. Uh, Lewy body dementia, uh, and I should say a frontal temporal dementia often presents almost more psychiatric. We have a lot of behavioral disinhibition that occurs. 
um, Lewy body dementia is the dementia that's uh, often marked by things like hallucinations, and we often see prominent hallucinations with that type of uh, dementia. Um, individuals who uh, get developed Parkinson's disease um, have, within a, about a five-year period, a significant number of them will develop Parkinsonian dementia. Uh, of course, we have dementias due to infectious diseases, uh, dementias that can occur due to head traumas, a whole other host of causal factors. But actually, when we do post-mortem analyses, about 40% of the individuals um, actually have what's called a mixed dementia. And one of the reasons we see that is because, in fact, these dementias are risk factors for each other. So, for example, if you've had several strokes, um, that actually increases the likelihood that you'll have a dementia of the Alzheimer's type later on. So they do tend to co-occur quite a bit. So the co-occurring dementia is about 40% of the cases. Now, you probably didn't need to hear this from me, but in case you weren't aware of it, the number one risk factor for dementia, especially vascular and Alzheimer's, um, is age. So, uh, you know, it's sort of good news, bad news as we strike each birthday. Uh, we made it another year, but our risk goes up. And you can see that from this chart here where it shows that, you know, prior to the age of 60, um, Alzheimer's dementia and really any dementias are pretty rare. I mean, all dementias put together are still uh, just half of 1% of the population. But notice what happens as we go up every five-year increment. What's happening is we're seeing a doubling, or in some cases a tripling, of the rate of dementia, such that when you get to 85 and older, um, we see that of the individuals uh, who make it to that point, about 23 to 33%, so somewhere between one in four and one in three individuals will develop a dementia of the Alzheimer's type. And in fact, if you can include all dementias, the numbers could get close to one in two. Those are incredibly large numbers, and that's often a big eye-opener for people. Um, and remember, I want to dovetail this in with what we just talked about earlier. We're doing things to keep ourselves living longer, right? <clears throat> Pushing, getting into that 85-plus age range. And we're succeeding. But this is what awaits us if we do nothing else. If all we do is the physical part to keep us living longer. And so that's the new challenge for us. This wasn't a challenge 100 years ago because we didn't have nearly as many people living this long. So this is kind of the catch-up part that we have to do. And of course, individual rates will vary uh, depending on risk factors and such, and I'll mention some of those as we go through this. Um, by the way, I do have some good news for you. If you make it to age 90 and you test clean, your odds start to go down. So hang in there. All right? Get you to age 90. Um, now, by the way, that, that part about testing clean, that's important. It just doesn't, it, I don't mean that if you make it to 90 and you've dodged someone actually tracking you down and testing you. Um, that's not quite the same thing. Okay. Uh, now, I did mention that age is the number one risk factor, but there are a number of other uh, risk factors. Um, we all often refer to the first three as the holy trinity of risk factors. Um, and so essentially it's cholesterol, diabetes, and hypertension. Um, it's not a big surprise that a significant portion of the uh, population in this country are on uh, cholesterol medication, blood pressure medication. Um, those are not just good things for your heart, if you need them. They're not just good things for your heart. They're actually good things for your brain as well. In fact, if you treat those conditions, it's best not to have them, but if you treat those conditions, um, that also significantly lowers your risk. So someone with, for example, regulated blood pressure, even if it's through medication, is, has a significantly lower risk than someone who has dysregulated blood pressure or diabetes or cholesterol, for example. Um, of course, the best way to get to all of these is through diet and exercise. Uh, that lowers your risk the most. Um, but not all of us can get there through diet and exercise for a variety of reasons. So uh, medications are certainly, I wouldn't recommend those as the, um, uh, you know, you get on them and say, well, now I can put all the salt in my food I want, and, you know, etc. cetera, uh, but rather to use it in conjunction with a healthier lifestyle. And remember, all lifestyle changes, best way to do them is gradually. Um, and, and ideally, it might get you to the point where you're less medication dependent, but uh, the medication does help get you there. Um, and, and assuming you can get there in a healthy uh, place, the, the better for your brain. By the way, a study came out by the AMA last year. It was supposed to be a, a, a three year longitudinal study, five year, excuse me, longitudinal study, which they discontinued after a year and a half. Um, many of you may have heard it, where they were looking at uh, targeting lower. Uh, numbers, target goal numbers for blood pressure. Uh, so as you know, the traditional is always 120 over 80, and then they use that as a, uh, a marker for when deviating in medication would be necessary. And they asked, they, they did the study where basically they tried lowering those target markers to 110 over 70, 
Um, and what they found was even after one year, they were seeing massive benefits. Um, and so they discontinued the study at that point and said, that's our new targets. Um, and so uh, for many of you, something to keep in mind if, if your uh, doctors are aware of that. Other uh, risk factors are head injuries. You're hearing a lot about concussions, for example, in the news. Um, as you know, when we were younger, I'll put you up with myself in here. Uh, when we were younger, uh, I, I played uh, some football when I was younger. Uh, we, they didn't really talk about concussions much back then. Um, and of course, as it turns out, those are a pretty significant risk factor. So if you lost consciousness due to head injuries, which for most people, by the way, the most common uh, occurrence of that occurs in motor vehicle accidents, uh, but there are other ways in which it can occur. Those are a risk factor for later developing dementia. Um, anoxia, so this is where your brain is deprived of oxygen. The most common form of that uh, is through sleep apnea. So for those of you who have untreated sleep apnea, it's a big risk factor. It's something that can be treated, sometimes very simply, um, just by not sleeping on your back. In fact, actually, I saw uh, about two years ago, one of the simplest interventions, uh, someone um, uh, has a, uh, uh, they sell it. It's a, essentially like a little vest, and it's got a tennis ball pocket at the back, which is so weak that it's really in your pocket. And so it's very uncomfortable to lay on your back, and so it causes people in the night to sleep on their side. If you have a mild enough form of sleep apnea, sometimes that's a sufficient intervention as opposed to the CPAP. Um, although they're, they're improving those, uh, those devices as well. Um, large amounts of alcohol use, also a major risk factor. And I, I emphasize large because we're going to talk a little bit about alcohol use in a favorable way, uh, certain types of alcohol, uh, in just a few minutes. Smoking. Uh, smoking is kind of a funny thing. It, it used to be thought of actually as a protective factor, which is kind of crazy. Um, but uh, uh, the reason that those data look favorable, meaning if you smoke, you were less likely to have uh, dementia, the Alzheimer's type, uh, it was because you were dying younger and less likely to get <laughs> When you actually control for uh, age of death, uh, then in fact it's a risk factor. Um, and then this one's interesting, um, personality, particularly for women, so highly neurotic women. So neuroticism is uh, the tendency to be a real worrier, for example. Um, that actually is an increased risk, risk factor. This was a longitudinal study. They, they followed 800 women for um, uh, many years, and they found it actually doubled their risk of developing uh, dementia. Uh, so see, they had something to worry about after all. <laughs> um, so in other words, what this speaks to, by the way, if you're wondering uh, what's the role here, is this is stress. Um, and stress can have an impact on dementia long term. So doing things to address your stress as well, things you can control. Or something. So, um, the meat of today's talk, though, is I am going to talk to you about a couple of studies, but I want to first do something that I like to do in my uh, research methods class when I'm teaching at the university, and that is to help you understand as new research comes out on this topic, what does it mean for you? Uh, and I, what I've done is I've broken this down into two ways in which you can look at research to evaluate, is it meaningful for older individuals, for older adults? Um, so the first question you can ask whenever a study comes out is, well, does the sample that they're, when you know, they say, oh, they found this is related to improved memory. And your first question might be, well, did they have any older individuals in the study? They had no older individuals. It doesn't mean it won't benefit older individuals, but the answer is we really don't know. Okay? And a lot of studies do target the people, as I mentioned earlier, that are easier to affect, and those often are younger individuals. So the first question doesn't include older individuals. The second question, this is probably a higher level, meaning it's more definitive that it actually has an effect on older individuals. Because you can have a sample that has some older individuals, but there is no effect for the older individuals. It's just all occurring in the younger ones, and as a group, there's still an effect, there's still an effect there, but it's being carried by the younger individuals. So the second level is, well, what happens if we just look at the older individuals? Are we still seeing an effect? So obviously, if you have a sample that's all older individuals, or if you break down that sample and just target the older individuals, are you seeing the same effect? That really tells us something about the findings and their meaning for uh, older individuals. Um, now, obviously, I won't get into all the other details of what makes a good study, but the ones that I'll show you, you do have those other features, so the control condition, for example, uh, random assignments, a number of other things, but we won't turn this into a research methods lecture. So just wanted to highlight uh, that uh, for you. Okay, so here are the two studies that we're going to talk uh, briefly about today. Um, they were both came out in 2015. Uh, one's referred to as the MIND study, and the other one's called the FINGER study. I guess we're picking body parts, I'm not sure how they are. Uh, these are both an acronyms. 
Um, and the reason these are such important studies is because they actually represent um, studies that one had control groups. They were large studies, a large swath of individuals included in them. They uh, did random assignment, um, and they were studies that were really done taking just community individuals and older individuals and showing some massive effects. Let's take a look at them. So, the MIND study is a diet study. It's a dietary study, dietary intervention. Um, and by the way, these uh, are studies that don't get, how many people have heard of these studies, by the way? Yeah, this is pretty typical. I, I speak to a lot of groups, um, and often no one's heard of these studies. Uh, does anyone want to guess why? There's no money to be made on these. Um, these are large, often government-funded uh, studies, uh, or, or uh, you know, NIH-funded studies. So the information's out there for anybody to get. No drug company can profit off this. Um, and so there's not a lot of advertising for this because it really works. In fact, this first study I'm going to show you had the largest effects we've seen in any study, bar none. There Medication companies would kill to get an effect like this for their pharmaceuticals. They don't even come close. Um, but you won't hear about this study because nobody can profit from it, but you can benefit from it, and it won't cost you a penny other than just what it might cost for the food that we're going to talk about. So what does the MIND stand for? Well, it's a combination of a Mediterranean diet and the diet to lower uh, for a diet for hypertension. So you've heard of probably both of those separate diets. Uh, the, uh, in fact, uh, some of you may be on the... Uh, one of these two or both of these uh, diets. Um, and it's a hybrid of sorts for both of them, so I'll briefly describe it. Um, so the DASH stands for the Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. This has been adopted by the American Medical Association, so if you have uh, hypertension, um, one of the approaches you can take in addition to medication is the uh, DASH diet. So this MIND study basically involved uh, about a thousand individuals. I followed them for four and a half years. Um, the age range of the individuals was 58 to 98, okay? uh, and the mean was actually over 70. So the vast majority of these are older indi individuals, so over half the individuals in this study. Um, and the goal was they were going to uh, randomly assign them to do one of the three diets. They were either going to do the Mediterranean diet, the DASH diet, or this MIND diet. Uh, and then they would uh, evaluate their cognitive abilities to see what, uh, whether they were developing um, dementia uh, after about four and a half years. So here's basically what the MIND diet looks like. Uh, they identify basically two uh, groups, healthy food groups and non-healthy food groups. Um, and so you can see in the first one uh, some examples of things that are uh, broad categories in the healthy groups are green leafy vegetables, really just vegetables in general, nuts. Berries, by the way, for berries, the brighter the berries, the bigger the uh, benefit. Uh, berries, of course, uh, have a chock full of antioxidants, um, and usually the brighter those berries, so think like blueberries, strawberries, or for bright colored berries, typically tips us off um, to the antioxidant component in them. And by the way, they are most um, filled with those antioxidants when they're in season. That's the best time to, uh, to eat them, but you can still benefit uh, from them ship them in all over the world, so they're in season somewhere in most places. Um, beans, my wife is happy about that. She's from the south, so you have to have beans. Um, whole grains, fish, poultry, olive oil, and here you will see wine. Uh, and I'm going to specify uh, specifically here when we say wine, uh, the wines that are, uh, again, most filled with those antioxidants that are beneficial to your brain are really the sort of dark red wine, so full Zins, cabs, those sort of woes, those full tasting wines. Not so much the sweet wines, not the, not the white wines, uh, but those are dessert wines. Uh, but those are the ones that really have that benefit. By the way, uh, the recommendation here is one to two glasses. Uh, those would be six ounce glasses, so just to clarify. Uh, so we're not talking one to two bottles. Uh, now there are also unhealthy food groups, uh, and they are in sort of categories as well. So it's the red meats, uh, butter or margarine, uh, cheeses, oh, that kills me, I like a good, good manchego or something. Uh, pastries and sweets, and fried or fast food. Now, uh, as you see, I, I, I do come from North Carolina. I'm originally from North Carolina, but I have been there for over 20 years. And you might imagine this is soul food for many people, uh, and uh, I'm sure the case here as well. But um, 
uh, and for some, this is their diet. Like this unhealthy group is pretty much what they eat most days. Uh, that is not a good track, uh, a good way to almost guarantee that you'll be experiencing dementia. Um, I also note that some recent research has suggested that it's the quality and preparation of these foods that's also important. So for example, you could be eating nice healthy fish, but if you're frying it, that's not good. Um, and so it's preparation and the quality of it is, is important as well. Um, here's essentially what a meal would look like on this uh, MIND diet. So at least three servings of whole grains uh, and other vegetables, a salad and a glass of wine should be occurring on most days. Um, beans on most days, you want to snack on things like nuts, poultry, berries at least twice a week, um, fish at least once a week. Okay, that's, that's sort of a, just a general rule and you can plug and play and make these any ways you like. Um, and no more than one serving a week in our category at the bottom. One serving per week. By the way, a dark chocolate um, is an exception. So when we say sweets, uh, dark chocolates actually are chock filled with antioxidants. So if you like to nibble a little bit on the dark chocolate, um, milk chocolate on the other hand, not a good thing. It would fall in that once a week category. It's interesting, by the way, the United States has one of the highest rates of Alzheimer's uh, in the world. Uh, and we are also one of the largest consumers of non-dark chocolate. Um, if you go to most of, for example, in Europe, uh, it's predominantly dark chocolate that they consume there, and they have markedly lower rates of Alzheimer's. So those things do make a difference. Um, here are the findings. So if you uh, if you take track these individuals for the four and a half years, um, what they basically showed was that over that four and a half year period, the individuals who were in the condition where they were on this mind diet, um, they experienced a 53% less cognitive decline over four and a half years. In other words, half of the cognitive decline experienced by the other groups, who by the way were on the DASH diet or on the Mediterranean diet, they essentially cut that decline in half. So imagine if you consider your brain decline, you individually, over the last five years, imagine if you cut that decline, in, over half of that decline you were able to eliminate it, just by doing this diet. And this is for older individuals. Um, the other thing that they found was that there was a really powerful, what we like to call, dose response curve, which essentially means the more closely people followed the diet, the bigger the effect they got. Um, however, the good news was even the individuals who just moderately followed the MIND diet, in other words, they, didn't, they weren't dead on it, but they were pretty, pretty close, you know, moderately following it, they still got the bulk of the effect. They saw a 35% decrease in, in, in the cognitive decline that they experienced over, 35, um, over four and a half years. Uh, this did not occur for the other two diets. In other words, the only effect that occurred for the other two diets occurred if you followed them strictly, but they were still markedly less, the effects, than you found with the MIND diet. So what this tells us is the MIND diet is not only really effective, but it's also kind of forgiving. Okay, it's kind of like that driver that lets even those bad swings keep it in the fairway. You can do, okay, that's for the golfers. The golfing analogy. I'm a terrible golfer. I need those kinds of All right. Now, as you might imagine, while diet is the biggest effect, now I like to talk about diet simply because um, as we get later in life, that's probably one of the things that we can adjust e more easily than, say, for example, physical exercise, which oftentimes there are other limitations uh, associated with that. But as it turns out, we also can get some great effects for physical exercise. I didn't mention this, by the way, but with the dietary intervention, um, there's a number of studies, I didn't get into the details here, I'm happy to speak about them, but um, that identify certain things. I mentioned antioxidants, for example, um, that have consistently shown in humans and other non-human species that cognitive decline can be forestalled, slowed, um, when you address those things. And so it's not surprising that a lot of these diets build on that research, and that's how they formulated this particular diet. Now, exercise works a little differently. Exercise actually builds the number of neurons in your brain. I don't know if you knew this, but when you exercise, your brain produces more neurons. So the neurons you have in your brain are constantly being produced. As we get older, the rate of production of new neurons slows down. But there's some things we can do that can pick it back up, and exercise is one of them. So for example, 
Um, we see cell, uh, both cell protection and production, neuronal cell production that occurs. Um, so this was a study of older adults, 120 of them. They were randomly assigned to either do an aerobic fitness, and I want you to pay attention, I picked this study specifically because of what the aerobic intervention is. This isn't training for a marathon. This is a brisk walk, 40 minutes, three days a week. And a brisk walk is something many people can do. By the way, uh, you can obviously, if you have some mobility issues, a pool is another good option. The key is sort of getting that heart rate elevated for some extended period of time, ideally about 40 minutes, three times a week. The control group did stretching. Uh, and what they found was after one to two years, they actually had a larger brain volume. In other words, their brains, when they did MRIs on them, were larger when they engaged in this physical exercise. And that's completely in keeping with what we know, which is more neurons are occurring. Of course, there's more neurons, that increases uh, uh, volume. Now, whether it's actually increasing volume, or it's uh, that compared to control, that theirs were decreasing, which naturally occurs as we age, um, that's probably a better at some combination of the two that's occurring. Uh, and again, we see a dose response curve for exercise, meaning you get more of an effect the more that you do. But the biggest effect is from going from sedentary to doing something. So for those of you who do absolutely no exercise, you will have the biggest benefit if you just do something. Um, and you'd be amazed at how simple that can be. I mean, you know, we spend a fair amount of time sedentary, like right now. Right? You're sitting here for about 45 minutes. Uh, you're watching TV, a movie, um, those sorts of things. You're just sitting, um, having a chat with individuals. Doing some low-level movements is a very good start, right? You begin maybe by uh, pushing off on your toes, and you're starting to move, circulate the blood a little bit. That little simple movement is a start. We build it up. And by the way, I would encourage you, if you do start doing anything, say like doing that first block, do this as a group, not individuals. Find a couple of folks. I don't mean like a mob, but you know, find like three or four friends. Um, and make that your walking group. You know, three days a week, we're going to go take a 40-minute walk. You've got such a beautiful campus here that you take advantage of the nice little hilly areas. Um, and you just take a nice brisk walk with, with the, a group. And it's wonderful because then you get a socialization experience out of it. And it also gets you going on those days that maybe you won't feel like taking a walk when you have three other people knocking on your door. Hazel, come on, it's walk time. You're a lot more likely uh, to go. Okay. Um, so as I said, dose response curve we see here as well, so the more the better. Now, engaging the mind is also critical. Why is that important? Well, as much as I just sold you on the benefits of exercise, the truth is, for most people, the benefits of exercise don't really get them the benefits they want. And the reason they don't is because within about 48 to 72 hours of your brain creating those new neurons from exercise, you know what happens to most of those neurons? They die. They die. Uh, and the reason for that is because our brain is incredibly efficient. It does not keep what it doesn't need. And so as you create more neurons, unless you use them, it gets rid of them. And so it, it'll hatch these new neurons, but it will not use, if you don't use them, they will die. And so essentially the benefits of exercise really only occur if you do this as a one-two punch. You do some physical exercise, creates new neurons, then you do some mental exercises to use those new neurons. That's a critical component. Um, now, by the way, uh, just as a little caveat here, when you're thinking about mental exercise, remember this. Your brain right now has sufficient neurons to do everything you are doing right now. So for those of you who sit there and say, and I have lots of people, well, I do crossword puzzles, right? Does that help me? Well, are you doing crossword puzzles now? Yes. Well, your brain is sufficiently resourced for you to do those crossword puzzles. Now, if you've never done crossword puzzles and you're thinking of taking them up, maybe that might have an effect. But if you're already doing them, anything you're doing right now, your brain has the neuron. By definition, you're doing it, so your brain has the neurons to do it. So the challenge here is to do something novel. Now, the good news is, this doesn't have to be super complicated. Okay? In fact, I'll give you some simple uh, examples. But let me show you another example here of a study. In this case, 200 older uh, adults, they were randomly assigned to do either challenging mental activities or a leisure activity. In this uh, study, the control condition was doing word puzzles. 
how can people ask me to go to CrossFit puzzle? That was the control condition in this uh, meeting that we're assuming they're not getting very much. And what they found was just after three months, the individuals who were doing the more challenging cognitive activities were already showing improved memory functioning. Now, what are these activities? And that's probably the million dollar question, or if you're uh, Lumosity, the multi-million dollar question. Um, uh, there's, there's a lot of debate on exactly what you need to do, and there's a lot of people trying to profit off of you, uh, to sell you products, telling you this is the thing you should do. So if you've ever been up late at night, you've probably seen commercials, especially about a year ago, for Lumosity. Um, let me just say that there's not a lot of evidence to suggest luminosity is one of those things that works very well. There's not necessarily evidence to say it doesn't, um, but not necessarily the evidence to say it does. They were kind of overstating their case, hence why the FTC uh, fined them actually $50 million. Um, that would have put them out of business, so they reduced the fine to $2 million. Um, but nevertheless, uh, they were sort of overstating their claim. There are, by the way, other brain... Um, games, if you will, that, uh, that have shown a fair amount of scientific evidence for their effectiveness. Probably the one that gets, if you want to buy a packaged program, is something called POSIT Science, P-O-S-I-T. Um, I have no stocks in this. Uh, in fact, this, is, this was created through a consortium of universities, uh, Harvard, MIT, a few other schools that got together and put this program together. They published a ton of studies showing um, its effectiveness. Um, other ones that have come along, like Lumosity, I think uh, Nintendo has a version. Um, they basically tried to model them after some of those validated ones and said, well, we basically do the same thing. And, and so you can use these. Um, that's unknown, but certainly um, as you think about things, maybe that won't cost you a penny. Let's start low grade. If you are brushing your teeth and you're right handed, start brushing with your left hand. You'll find it incredibly challenging. <laughs> this is assuming you don't have mobility issues. And all of a sudden, the thing that you did automatically and you weren't even thinking about, all of a sudden now you've got to think about it. It's not as easy. You're doing something novel with your brain. Let me give you another example. Although learning a new language sounds incredibly challenging, that walking group that you just created, why don't you each learn five new words in a new language? By the way, all the same language. We don't want to create the Tower of Babel here. Um, so let's say you take up Italian. Ora si parla l'italiano stamani. I have an edge. I'm Leonardo Bruno Lecce, so I actually speak Italian. But, that's a, but let's say you did that. Uh, and you start your walking group, and each of you picks up five new words. And while you're walking for 40 minutes, you teach each other your five words. Wouldn't that be an incredible year? By the end of the year, you'll have a pretty good lexicon of words. You'll be healthier and have created those new, new um, neurons from walking. You're using them by learning new information. And you could cap it off with a trip to Italy to go have that Mediterranean <laughs> diet. <laughs> All right, just an idea. But all right, now we're going to take a look at one uh, study that actually packages all these things together. And I do want to emphasize um, that while we are going to look at this package together with this Finnish study, um, as I said, by far the biggest effects are just the dietary ones that we talked about already with mind states. But if you do anything else, that's kind of your easiest path to making some differences, especially with the moderate effects, uh, the effects that you still get with moderate adherence. But in this case, here's our uh, randomly controlled, or randomized uh, study with a control condition. It's a large cohort you're going to see, very low dropout rate. It was done in uh, Finland, uh, sponsored by the government. They developed this study. It was a two-year um, uh, study in which they addressed basically the things we talked about, physical exercise, mental exercise, and diet. Um, they focused specifically on older individuals. And on top of that, they even targeted individuals who were at risk for cognitive decline, meaning they were already starting to show some problems. So they're not just taking older individuals, they're taking older individuals with a very high risk for developing dementia. Um, this uh, particular study had over 1,200 individuals. And by the way, uh, this, the results that I'm showing you here are from the first two years of the study. Next year, they're scheduled to publish the first five years of the study. So we'll have a little more information uh, on that uh, very soon. A couple of important features for this study. First of all, uh, they began enrollment in 2009, and so we're seeing the data that goes to 2011. Um, these are 60 to 77 year olds. Uh, you'll notice that uh, they screened individuals, and the reason they were screening them was they were deselecting the healthy people and identifying the ones that had some cognitive risk factors. 
Uh, large uh, intervention group, 631, control group, 229, so they're matched with each other. Um, what's really impressive here is their retention rate. So look what happens after 12 months. They still have 93% of the sample. Um, and at uh, 24 months, so two years in, they still had 88% of the sample. And remember, that's incredible for a number of reasons. First of all, when you're dealing with older adults, you're gonna have natural attrition because some of them may pass away in that time. But on top of that, it's actually hard to keep people involved in a study. If you've ever taken part in a study, people drop out for a number of reasons. They move, et cetera. Um, and so for them to have this incredible retention rate, I actually asked the author about this. I was at a conference uh, and met her, um, and, and I was curious, that, because this is an unusually high retention rate. Usually you're lucky if you keep 50% of your people over two years here. Um, and she said that her thought on why this happened was because in both the intervention and control groups, they had everybody doing things in groups. So you had a team, so you were like the blue team or the red team. Um, and that that actually helped because they became social groups and they wanted to interact with each other. And so that was a, a, an interesting um, approach that they took and something we might want to emulate in our uh, studies here. So as I mentioned, they'll have a specialized diet. It's actually very similar to the MIND diet. The thing that was probably most noteworthy that was different than the MIND diet was in this case they had physicians examine everyone and determine if they uh, might have been overweight. And if they were overweight, then they tweak the diet with a little more protein, a little less uh, carbs uh, to help bring their uh, weight down a little bit. So they, they sort of made it a little more personalized for each individual. Physical and mental exercise was occurring. Um, the control group was an active control. They were still getting, do, uh, getting together, they were socializing, they were doing a number of activities, they just weren't doing the specific interventions that were targeting uh, improvements in brain function. Here is basically what they found. So the intervention group after two years, and as I said, we'll see more data going forward. They had better performance on memory tests, they had better performance on executive tests, that's basically frontal lobe uh, functioning, decision making, if you will judgment, problem solving, um, and they even showed improved speed of processing, so they were thinking quicker as well. This represents the first randomized control study with a, a, a clear control group with older adults who are at high risk for cognitive decline, and even in this group, the three simple things, diet first and foremost, physical and mental exercise, to have a profound effect on people's uh, risk for developing dementia. Uh, we're going to tr track these folks for seven years, so there will be a lot to see. So, in the end, what this is telling us is it's never too late. Okay, so if you look at, in fact, I, I gave a talk one time. I had someone come out, up to me afterwards. She said, you know, uh, doctor, I'm 88 years old. Is it too late? I said, well, I guess it depends how much longer you're planning on living, right? <laughs> you're going to drop dead tomorrow? No, yep, I'd say it's probably too late. But, you know, if you're pretty, and she was, if you're pretty healthy, you're going to hang around, then the goal is, in the very least, maintain what you have. This is the best advice I can give you. If you'll age in place, you get to enjoy your life, it's, you know, we come full circle to what we talked about, being physically healthy, but not taking care of our brains doesn't make any sense. You know people that have dementias. That's not a good life when you're, you're alive and there's nothing going to kill you in the next 10 years, but you're not there mentally. You want to be there. You want to be there for you. You want to be there for your family. You want to be able to enjoy your life. Now, by the way, I want to end on a really happy note for you. Um, there is actually one other uh, uh, group of studies. I didn't include this in here, and it's not been any of these uh, studies that we talked about. But as it turns out, there's actually a pretty impressive body of literature uh, saying that regular sexual activity also decreases the likelihood of you uh, developing dementia. Now, um, I'm going to talk about this with two studies to rule something out. The first study, which was a Manchester University study, came out in 2015. It was a survey, about 1,700 people, and they basically, and again, these were older adults, mean age was 71, um, and they basically found that the old, that the individuals who were engaged, more likely to be engaging in regular sexual activity were actually the least likely to show the, the uh, cognitive decline. But as you know, there's a confound in this study, because it may be the case that people that are more cognitively intact are just more likely to be doing this, and those who are less are less likely. That's a major confound in a survey study like this. Enter study number two. In 2010, they actually did an experiment. Um, now this, I, I should note that this was on rats. So we can't do these experiments on rats. Um, but nevertheless, 
um, they hunt rats. So now we take rats and we randomly assign them. Some are going to engage in sexual activity and some are not. Uh, and what they found was that the region of the brain, which is the hippocampus that is specifically targeting the brain, that they actually showed differences in the hippocampal volume in the ones that were randomly assigned for sexual activity and those that were not. So this suggests it's probably, even though there may be some effect that it, that's associated with, well, more cognitive attack and more likely to do that, it also appears that there seems to be a causal effect, um, and probably related to some of the things we talked about, exercise, for example, mental stimulation, all of those things. All right. Um, so, really, some, one of the takeaway points here is that lifestyle can have a significant impact uh, on your cognitive function. And this is just sort of a visual chart to show you that. Um, a number of things that can, as you get into the positive numbers, those are increasing risk for developing dementia. And there are many things we talked about, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, uh, homeocysteine, we didn't get into the research on that, depression, I talked about stress, for example. Those are all things that increase your risk. And then on the negative side, meaning they decrease your risk, we see things like regular exercise, antioxidant intake, social activities, even education. Remember we talked about cognitively challenging your brain, aging in education, even later in life, um, are things that mentally stimulating you. Those are things that can improve your chances or decrease your chances. Okay, so in summary, um, what I'm going to challenge you to do here forward is to engage in preventative care. By that, I don't mean go to your doctor and ask for memory medication. <laughs> what we're talking about here is just doing the simple things. And remember, if you do zero exercise, you'll have the biggest effect just by doing something, a low-grade intervention, maybe a brisk walk. That's sufficient. The benefits that you'll get from that, and especially from things like dietary changes, um, are there even for people who do it moderately? So these are forgiving interventions. You don't have to be as strict, you know. And by the way, I, one thing I want to note as I went over some of those foods, notice that we're not talking about diets that require you to have rice cake and water. <laughs> these are actually good foods. And no one's ever gone to the, for example, Mediterranean region of, of this planet and said, man, that was terrible food, right? <laughs> You're going to come away with a good meal. So. Um, and these can make measurable differences and have a huge impact in your quality of life, even if you start them now. Thank you very much for having me, and I think we'll uh, have a few questions. Yes, Dr. Uh, Dr. Does anyone have a question for Dr. Leitchi? Mr. Phillips, hold on. This is all very interesting. I enjoyed it. My memory's not so very good. Do you have a copy of what you just did that we could, we could have to? Now, sir, this is the third so time. We can you, yeah, this so is the third time you've asked that question. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> four, four. I believe uh, we will uh, have a PDF yes. of this uh, available. Yes. Yes, we can do that. Thank you for asking. So we learned a lot today. I know I did. I hope you did too. Any other questions? Dr. Solium? Connie has a mic. Thank you. Uh, it was very enjoyable indeed and informative. I wonder how much the discipline is an important part of this. And secondly, how much vegetarians are benefiting automatically it's a two great questions. So uh, the first question regarding discipline. So obviously discipline, sometimes by the way in psychology we use the term self-regulation, if you're a good self-regulator for things. Um, that usually plays a significant role in any type of intervention because it predicts how well you will follow it. And as you saw, we see a dose response curve, meaning the more you follow things, the better the benefit. So absolutely there's an effect for that. Uh, just as an illustration, um, some of you can begin to diet or exercise and do it very well on your own. You kind of monitor it. And then there's others who, unless there's someone with you making you do it, um, you don't follow it so well. And so we know that while you'll still benefit even doing some of these uh, interventions partially, there's a big effect for um, uh, the term discipline or what we like to call in psychology self-regulation. If you're able to self-regulate some of these things, it 
as we saw, stick to the more you'll get a much bigger benefit from them. So you'll get some if, you, if you're not fully involved. Um, the second question, um, I'm sorry, boy, this is bad. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's time for me to have my memory check. So, um, uh, being a vegetarian, you do benefit, obviously, uh, if you see from the, um, at least some of the list of things that are no-nos, if you will. Obviously, the red meats are off the table. Um, so, obviously, a vegetarian diet, I think the big issue for vegetarians is preparation of food. Um, so, you can see how you can slip into that um, bad foods if you're frying a lot of your vegetables and your tempura, those sorts of things. Um, so, in that regard, I think you get some natural benefits. Uh, but it's also important to make sure that um, that you are preparing foods. For most vegetarians, the other advantages they typically tend to eat more fresh food um, by nature of them being vegetables. So vegetables are probably one of the safest things uh, you can eat. Now the, the only comment I would make um, is to make sure that you're still getting uh, the high antioxidant intake because antioxidants are not necessarily heavily in all in vegetables. You, you tend to see that in uh, or a vegetarian diet. Tend, you see that in some other things, but. Um, certainly, I think a vegetarian diet gives you a, a huge leg up um, on, over other more standard dietary practices. Thank you for your questions. Yes, sir. First, as a follow-up to that, what about organic? I suppose. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. So, uh, as you know, the, we do, uh, in processing our foods, we put a lot of things in our foods that aren't necessarily good for you. So, uh, if you are able to uh, afford and have access to organic, uh, products, as you saw in that 2017 study, that goes a long way to the quality of the food. Um, I do understand that that's, uh, you know, there are organic uh, production can be expensive uh, for individuals, and so that's not necessarily an option. But whenever it is, um, I would encourage you to do that. And by the way, if you, when you're shopping at grocery stores, one of the ways that you can benefit from organic without having to pay for organic is organic stuff goes bad much quicker. Uh, and so surprisingly, if you ever go to the like sale bin, like stuff they're trying to get rid of today, you'll find a lot of organic stuff there because it has a much shorter shelf life. Um, and so shopping off that, you're buying it, you're going to eat it that night, but uh, that's not a bad way to, uh, to, to do that. Also, you said that uh, your brain is at the point for what you do now. Is, is there, let's say one becomes proficient in doing Sudoku. Yes. Should at some point should someone move on to yes. crossword puzzles or language? Yes, or that's a great question. So as I as as I noted and as was noted in this question, eventually your brain learns to do things. The minute your brain learns to do that thing, it is no longer a workout for your brain to do those things. So when you are really good at Sudoku and crossword puzzles, those are no longer and by the way, if you enjoy them, I'm not telling you to stop doing them, keep doing them. But just know that's your enjoyment, not your workout. Your brain workout will have to keep pushing it. A good analogy might be, uh, imagine someone who's training for the Olympics. Okay? Um, at some point, they get in such good shape that going for a 40-minute run is about as much of a workout as it would be for you and I to walk up to the buffet. It's just not a workout for them. They're just too, too good in shape at that point. So at that point, continue to just run 40 minutes is doing nothing for them in terms of continuing improvement. So great question, yes. I'm really sorry. Um Dr. Lechi is going to take a little break. We need to kind of transition this room. As you know, we have a lot of guests who have been on the bridge having brunch, and they are brand new to Westminster Canterbury, and they are waiting to hear Dr. Lechi's program. So we're going to take a little break. We can have him right outside the library over here. So if you do have a question you want to follow up with him, please do. But we do need to kind of transition the room so that the other folks can come in and hear him speak again. But let's give him a great round of applause.